if a child is conceived in rape, is that child still worth protecting? How'd you guys decide to rebuild? The majority of people in town are poor bastards, couldn't afford to leave. Do we know for sure that Mozart wasn't gay? Former White House counsel Don McGahn defied a congressional subpoena, pulling a no-show at a House Judiciary Committee hearing on whether President Trump obstructed justice. McGahn was acting on orders from the White House, which asserted that his testimony was protected by executive privilege. Hours later, the committee issued two new subpoenas that will probably also be ignored, one to former White House Communications Director Hope Hicks and another to McGahn's former chief of staff. Indonesia's incumbent president, Joko Widodo, has officially won re-election, comfortably beating a nationalist former army general who's been alleging fraud since before last month's vote. The election commission released its results a day early and at 2 a.m. in an apparent attempt to prevent protests from breaking out. It didn't work. The losing party says it's planning to challenge the results in court. Ahead of her fourth attempt to make any headway at all with her Brexit plan in Britain's parliament, Prime Minister Theresa May unveiled what she's calling a new deal. Her 10-point plan is a lot of the same, except for one major concession that shows her desperation, a conscience vote on whether to give the public a second vote on Brexit, but only if parliament passes her plan in June. For those MPs who want a second referendum to confirm the deal, you need a deal and therefore a withdrawal agreement bill to make it happen. The Texas House passed a final version of its so-called Save Chick-fil-A bill after the San Antonio City Council blocked the openly religious chain from opening a location in the airport over its record of donating to anti-LGBTQ causes. The legislation would prevent the government from punishing people or businesses who affiliate themselves with a religious organization, which is a vague way for legislators to say they want to eat a spicy deluxe and waffle fries before flying out of San Antonio. Across the country today, pro-abortion rights activists protested the recent wave of anti-abortion laws passed by state legislatures across the South and Midwest. I believe that we will win! I believe that we will win! The latest state to attack reproductive rights? Louisiana. A bill banning abortion after a fetal heartbeat is detected, usually around six weeks, is working its way through the legislature there. Show me what solidarity looks like! This is what solidarity looks like! Louisiana's bill isn't the most extreme of the new laws. That distinction still belongs to Alabama. But it does stand out in one way. Its sponsor, a state senator named John Milkovich, is a Democrat. So is the governor, John Bell Edwards, who said that he'll sign the bill. That's obviously not what you'd expect, given that in this post-Kavanaugh world, Democrats seem to be pushing out any wiggle room on limiting a woman's access to abortion. There's certain room for any voter to have any personal view that they want. But what I don't support is Democratic candidates who don't value women, who don't believe that women are entitled to basic reproductive freedom, civil rights, and human rights. But it turns out that there is a strand of the party that opposes abortion rights. And we're not talking about people like Joe Biden or Tim Ryan, whose positions on the issue have shifted over the years. We're talking about Democrats who oppose abortion, Kristen Day is the director of Democrats for Life of America, a Virginia organization that says it works to, quote, protect human life at all of its stages. A good summary for us, I think, is we're pro-life for the whole life. So from womb to tomb. Do you think that some of these other bills, though, in Alabama, where um, there are no exceptions for rape or incest, is that a good bill? Yeah, I think it makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Does it make you uncomfortable? You know, it, it, a, a little bit, only because I think we're, it, it moves the focus away from the majority of abortions to this tiny subset. But, uh, and, and also the fact that I have met um, children uh, who were conceived in rape, and they're really very happy to be here. You know, it's, it's a very sensitive and emotional uh, time and topic. It's all, the purpose of it is to, to go to the Supreme Court and try to challenge it. Sure, but it still sends a message to the women in Alabama, though. 
Yes, it does. But it also, I think it opens the conversation about when does life begin? And if a child is conceived in rape, is that child still worth um, protecting? Why are you a pro-life Democrat? I believe that the government does have a responsibility to care for those who need assistance. And the Democratic Party has been more in line with providing for um, pro social programs that support those who need assistance. The, and um, so that is probably the main reason why I went on that trajectory. I spoke with Kirsten Gillibrand and she said uh, there is no room in the Democratic Party for pro-life Democrats. What is your response to someone like that? She's trying to make the party smaller. And uh, that's a mistake again. I mean, she's coming from a perspective of New York. And New York and California don't represent the rest of the views of the country. And so, but if you get rid of the pro-life Democrats, what happens usually is they're replaced with Republicans. So is that what she wants in the rest of the country? Because, I mean, that's not going to be a very popular um, result. The 2020 Democratic field right now has more than 20 candidates. Is there anyone that you can support right now in that field? Uh, of the major candidates, there is nobody in the field right now that is uh, actually trying to get our vote. Joe Biden says he now opposes the Hyde Amendment. In the past, he had said that he does not support um, federal funding of abortions. Do you think that he was a, a pro-life Democrat? I thought he could provide a more central and moderate uh, position on abortion. Uh, so it's hugely disappointing to see him try to cater to the abortion lobby. So then what do you do? I think we keep, uh, whether we do a writing campaign, whether we don't vote. In 2016, a lot of pro-life Democrats did not vote. And I don't want to see the Democratic Party make that mistake again. Would you rather see Donald Trump reelected in 2020 than to see a Democrat become the president? That, you know, that's a... That's a very tough question because if all the pro-life Democrats go and vote for this candidate who's going to support abortion, um, they're going to take us for continue to take us for granted and our votes for granted. So we do have to make a stand and say that we are not going to continue to support a party that doesn't want us. Over the past two decades, American immigration policy has been radically reshaped by something called the Flores Settlement Agreement. Family detention, catch and release, family separation. In one way or another, they all go back to Flores. The story starts in 1985, with a group of immigrant kids who were being detained with adults some of them in this house in Pasadena. The, the lawsuit is said that there are too many kids crammed into an area, that they're with adults, uh, that they're not given proper meeting. Peter Shea was one of their lawyers. They were all being held in basically in adult detention centers. They were being commingled with unrelated adults. They were not being provided any services that children should be provided, whether it's medical assessment, medical treatment, reading materials, visitation, access to telephones, education, etc. The case took 12 years to resolve and ended up with a settlement that established key rights for detained minors. First, Kids should be released from custody, ideally to parents or guardians, as quickly as possible. If that's not an option, they should go to shelters that meet certain standards and are licensed to care for children. In other words, they should not be kept in adult detention centers. This is what came to be known as the Flores Settlement Agreement, after one of the plaintiffs, 15-year-old Jenny Flores. At the time the agreement went into effect, and for years afterward, the government's interpretation of the settlement was that it only applied to kids who'd come without their parents. But in 2015, that all changed. There had been a big surge in a new kind of immigration, families crossing the border. They often ended up in detention together. Peter Shea went back to court, saying that kids who were being detained with their parents had Flores rights too. Federal judges largely agreed and said every kid should be released from detention within 20 days. Leon Fresco was the government's lead lawyer in the case. Quite frankly, it never occurred to the government 
that using family facilities would violate the Flores Settlement Agreement because in everyone's mind, it was so obvious that Flores only applied to unaccompanied minors. It wasn't until we got sued that we realized, oh, wait a second, there are people who are now gonna make the argument that Flores is gonna apply to families. And that's exactly what happened. The ruling forced the government to reassess how it handled kids in detention. There were three basic things we could do, where we could maintain the family together during their removal proceedings, we could let the family into the United States, and there was a third option which nobody wanted to do, which was to separate the child and keep the parent detained. The ruling eliminated option one, because the government could only detain families together for long periods if the facilities for holding them could comply with Flores, which none do. And the Obama administration had already said option three was off the table. So the government chose option two, letting families go, in what came to be known as catch and release. So once we lost the Flores Agreement decision in both the district court and in the Court of Appeals, we had no choice but to release families into the United States. Trump, though, hated mass releasing immigrants. So his administration chose the harsher response, family separation. They released the kids to shelters, but kept the parents in custody. So a settlement designed to make our treatment of immigrant kids more humane helped lead to a thoroughly inhumane policy. Family separation only lasted about two months before a public outcry forced Trump to backpedal. Free the children now! So now he's intent on doing away with Flores, even if he isn't exactly clear on who Flores is. Uh, Judge Flores, whoever you may be, that decision is a disaster for our country. A disaster. In September, the administration issued a draft rule that would allow families to be detained together. That's sure to land the administration back in court. Trump has also been pushing Congress to pass legislation to supersede Flores, and it has allies in that cause. Just last week, Senator Lindsey Graham introduced legislation that would extend the amount of time the government can hold kids in detention from 20 days to 100. As long as uh, you have a child with you, and 20 days is the standard. We can't process the claim in 20 days. We need more time and we need more bed space. Even as Trump and his allies tried to dismantle Flores, though, Peter Shea, the attorney who shaped the settlement in the first place, is trying to expand it. He's planning to file a motion that says the country's largest shelter for immigrant kids violates Flores, an allegation with the potential to force major changes to the system, yet again. They open the window. Does it slide easy? This window is gonna fall out of the whole thing. Look at it. Okay, so. Chimsy has stupid window out. <laughs> Philip and Kristen Harvey have lived in paradise for almost five decades. Okay, beat the bastard in until it doesn't take up no room and move on. Philip works in construction and Kristen is a waitress. When the campfire hit their town six months ago, the mobile homes where they live with their three daughters were burned down. Now they're rebuilding. It's 13 foot two, which means on my car hauler, it's gonna be low enough to go underneath an underpass. Planning ahead. Well, I mean, you know, we lost everything. The city of Paradise estimates two to 3,000 people are now living here. The population used to be 26,000. How'd you guys decide to rebuild as opposed to, I don't know, taking off? Is it too damn poor to move anywhere? The majority of people in town are not people that came back to rebuild. The majority of people in town are poor bastards, couldn't afford to leave, or, or idiots like me that got some kind of family and can't find nowhere else to live now because there's nowhere to find. You can't find a place to live. Well, what are you guys doing for electricity and water right now? Yeah, and I pay my neighbor for electricity. And water, you're just using? The city water. The Paradise Irrigation District, the city's water authority, has warned residents to avoid drinking the water because of toxins found in the system. Are you nervous that that water's contaminated? Am I nervous that it's contaminated? Did the coffee taste bad? <laughs> I, I make coffee We use it. a lot of bottled water. I do, think bottled water. I do think bottled water's safer. Do I, do I care about it enough to, to go out of my way to use it? No. Do I make the girls use it? Yes. I 
It just tastes like water. Actually, it tastes a little bit like hose, but I like to drink out of the hose just because I did that when I was a kid. So far, the irrigation district has taken 600 water samples. Roughly a third have tested positive for unsafe levels of the cancer-causing chemical benzene, which it believes got into pipes through air contaminated with ash, soot, and melting plastic. So we're going to 6491 Clark Road, um, the church here in town. That church was not burnt at all. So it's right there. I see it right now. Where are you going, honey? <laughs> honey? I'm going up on the grass. <laughs> what? <sighs> Kenneth. Husband and wife duo Ken and Laura Capra are two of the water department specialists who have been circling town since December. They live just outside Paradise. Their house survived the campfire and is on a separate water system, which so far is clear of benzene. So what we're doing right now is we're getting ready to take a sample. Some situations on our samples show that we're over the maximum contaminant level, some show not. What we're trying to do right now is sample different services, especially standing structures, to see if their service connection is bad. So what does the jar say? So this is a dechlorinating agent, has ascorbic acid in it. So what it's doing is it's taking out the chlorine in the water. That way, whatever the labs get, it's going to be absolute, whatever is in the water. So, so these are some of the few homes that didn't burn down? That's correct. And are yeah. people living here? Some people have returned, some people haven't. And can they use the water in there? If they use the water, it's not drinkable. Don't take hot showers, use lukewarm water, and use bottled water for drinking, especially in cooking. Would you even take a shower? So I have been. I kind of look at it as, OK, I won't drink it, but I am taking a shower in it. Is there a part of you that's like a little bit concerned that maybe that's not the best thing? If I was 25, 30 years old and I had little kids, I would really not do it at all. Wow. But I still won't drink it. Making water safe to drink again will require testing and repairing a system that includes 172 miles of pipeline, a project the district estimates will take roughly three years and cost up to $300 million. And that's just a fraction of the campfire's overall cost. Removing debris is projected to be nearly $2 billion, while insurance claims have reached almost 12. So far, the governor's committed more than $800 million to wildfire prevention, response, and recovery. And state legislators are putting forward bills that incentivize people to build in cities, not in rural areas like Paradise. There's so much red tape to try and get money, funding, help. It takes so long to do it, and I think that's where everybody has a frustration. Eight hours to burn down this town is going to take couple years to rebuild at least. And that's that's a really good start. But then you have like this church right here who puts out these banners, we got this. They're there to help the community and show that there's got to be hope in this town. And there is hope in this town. Otherwise, people would say, forget it. Don't rebuild the water system because we're not coming back. Books are full of facts, and the internet is full of other things. I'm Carly Rae Jepsen, and I'm here to fact check the internet on Vicepedia. I love Wikipedia. It's always so interesting to hear what you've done in your life. After graduating from school, Jepson relocated to Vancouver's west side where she held several minimum wage jobs. She worked at Trees Organic Coffee as a barista. I was great at latte art. I was a horrible bartender, though. Whatever you wanted, I tried to convince you that what you really wanted was a screwdriver. <laughs> Forget what I said about Carly Rae Jepsen being the Mozart of our generation. They're not even on the same level. Well, that is true. Mozart is much above most people's caliber of music, including my own. 
But it goes on to say, Carly Rae Jepsen, gay icon and activist. Mozart, not even gay. <laughs> Do we know for sure that Mozart wasn't gay? I just have questions. My girl got sworded again. Sorted, sworded. I've been knighted a few times, this is true. I don't know where this started. I have nothing to do with it. But I have been handed a sword on stage, mostly because I think someone started a campaign saying that I needed one. And I guess everyone needs a sword. Carly Rae Jepsen as swords, a thread. Oh, wow. Have I started a sword line that I'm unaware of? I have white ones. Am I making money off of this? Carly Rae Jepsen teases Vegas residency. It wasn't a tease, sorry, false news. I don't know about a Vegas residency. It sounds like interesting to be able to do the same show in the same place all the time. However, it's Vegas and you must live there. Ooh. Does this say a one hour saxophone version of the song? But why? Sexy. Please stand up for our national anthem. I mean, O Canada does need a rewrite, let's be honest. The perfect loop doesn't exit. And then they don't finish exist. That was very clever. This video single-handedly brought peace to the Middle East. <laughs> the internet's weird. This is currently one of the first 15 questions asked on OkCupid for Canadians. Who is the best Canadian music export? Carly Rae Jepsen. Liking Carly Rae Jepsen is literally in my top five requirements for a potential partner. I wouldn't trust them if they didn't listen to some nice pop, you know, friendly music. If you really hate that, you're an unhappy person. We have to go back because I'm confused. Celine Dion is on that list. No one beats Celine Dion, and that's the way it is. Yeah.